Welcome to the third and, uh, in many ways, regrettably, final uh, lecture of this series by uh, Dr. Jenny McComas. Um, the first two have been absolutely uh, invigorating in terms of artistic knowledge of, of an area that we in Britain certainly don't know enough about. And this evening's uh, lecture on Paul Rosenberg, uh, in my view, is um, he is one of the pivotal figures of, of, of modernism in 20th century British art. And in fact, there could be a, a, a whole series of lectures on the, uh, the Rosenberg family and the interlinking with Wildenstein and Nazi Lucid Art. And wherever you go, uh, Rosenberg somewhere or another uh, is involved. And uh, that makes the whole thing exceptionally exciting. Uh, this has been a momentous week in the world. Um, we had the funeral of our, of our late majesty. Um, we have a new prime minister in Great Britain. Uh, we, we, we received 500 dignitaries from across the world. And President Putin has this evening announced uh, the mobilization of 300,000 uh, more troops uh, to whatever degree of training they are and a threat of nuclear uh, war um, and he's not bluffing. So we are living in very, very strange and dangerous times. And I think in a funny sort of way, that also reflects Rosenberg and his pivotal and uh, uh, extraordinary uh, life in within 20th century art. Uh, I could go on for hours. Uh, he's my favorite subject of the period, uh, but why listen to me when we have Dr. Jenny McComas, who really does know, and she's going to launch into her lecture now. Jenny, over to you and thank you. Thank you, David. Um, and again, it's a pleasure to join this group for the third lecture in this series. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Give me one second. Now, when um, David asked if I would give some talks on emigre art dealers in the United States during World War II, there are so many to choose from, and we talked about a couple earlier, but Paul Rosenberg is probably the best uh, known example and, and the most fascinating in many ways. So uh, today we'll be focusing primarily on him. Now, my interest in emigre art dealers stems from the provenance research that I've conducted on European art at the Eskenazi Museum of Art, where I'm curator. And this research has given me so much insight into the significant role that these individuals played, not only in the development of our collection here at this museum, but at museums uh, across the United States. Um, but because it's research on, on the collection I work with that really sparked my interest in this topic to begin with, I'm going to start us off with a comparison of two paintings in our collection. And the first is this work, The Studio of 1934 by Pablo Picasso. This painting, like so many of Picasso's compositions, centers on the representation of the women in his life. Here, the artist's pregnant mistress, Maria Therese Walter, reclines on a couch, while a figure usually identified as Picasso himself paints a floral still life in the background emphasizing the work's theme of fertility. Although it's not among the most famous of Picasso's compositions, this work is among the best known paintings in the Eskenazi Museum's collection. It's almost always on view in our galleries, unless it is out on loan to one of the many Picasso exhibitions held with regularity around the world, or at least in the days before COVID. And the second painting I wanna focus in on, Place of Darkness, is by the American artist, Abraham Ratner. Um, his dates, by the way, were 1893 to 1978, I believe. Um, in this composition, we see a collection of grotesque figures arrayed against a dark blue background. At left, a red-faced figure appears to be crying out in pain. 
His face is illuminated by a candle held by a clown-like character rendered in shades of blue. Above this creature in the center, a masked figure wearing a plumed hat tilts his head towards the ghostly apparition of an angel holding a guitar. At right, a faceless knight is accompanied by a bird-like creature riding a horse. Ratner described the figures in this work as sinners and the composition as apocalyptic. Later writing, quote, this painting was an expressive outlet for the dubious regard I often felt for the future of civilization, unquote. Although it entered our museum's collection in 1958, the painting, although arguably one of Ratner's most important, was rarely on view until recently when we undertook a major reinstallation of our permanent collection galleries, intentionally including some works by less canonical artists. Yet despite the wide gap in these artists' canonical status, these paintings by Picasso and Ratner share a number of intriguing connections. The first is a connection you might have already noticed. Ratner, as I think is clear, was influenced by Picasso. <clears throat> this is really no surprise, for Ratner lived for nearly two decades in Paris from 1920 to 1939, when the outbreak of war forced him to return to his native country. <clears throat> Moving within the modernist artistic circles of Paris between the wars, Ratner could hardly have avoided coming into contact with Picasso. And he surely saw Picasso's masterful mural, Guernica, which was displayed in the 1937 World's Fair in Paris. Picasso painted Guernica in response to the fascist bombing of a Spanish town in 1936, rendering the agony and horror of the victim's experience in stark black and white. Ratner's painting, despite the title Place of Darkness, explodes with brilliant color, but the echoes of Guernica are unmistakable in the composition's dense figural grouping and expressions of anguish. Ratner painted Place of Darkness in the early 1940s, completing it as the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising was underway in the spring of 1943. With that background, and Ratner's own description of the work as apocalyptic in mind, it might even be that he deliberately evoked Picasso's well-known mural, a mural which at the time was on view at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. After all, he painted this composition in response to the horrifying news of the ongoing genocide of Europe's Jews. In addition to the stylistic and conceptual similarities, the two paintings we just looked at share a provenance. Both were formerly in the private collection of Henry Radford Hope, an art historian, curator, and collector who chaired the Department of Fine Arts at Indiana University, where I work, from 1949 to 1969, from, sorry, from 1941 to 1969, and who also served as the first director of the Eskenazi Museum of Art. Hope had purchased both paintings from the New York Gallery of Paul Rosenberg, the Picasso in 1944 and the Ratner in 1946 or 47. Two weeks ago, I discussed Kurt Valentin and Karl Nierendorf, two of the German emigre art dealers who established an American, art, an American market for expressionism in the late 1930s. And we'll spend our time today, as you know, with Paul Rosenberg, an emigre from France, who also became a major player in the wartime art market in New York, but whose life offers us some different perspectives into the intersection of exile and the art world. While I'll focus today primarily on Rosenberg's activities as an art dealer, I'll also touch on the fate of the works he left behind in France and which were looted by the Nazis. The two paintings in Henry Hope's collection, returning briefly, to those uh, represent two different facets of Paul Rosenberg's promotion of modernism, both his well-known connection to Picasso and other giants of the French modernist canon, and his little-known patronage of American artists, some of whom, like Ratner, have since fallen into near obscurity. 
Paul Rosenberg, born in 1881, can rightly be considered one of the most influential art dealers of the 20th century. As I've already noted, he represented the most groundbreaking French artists of his generation, supporting them through sales of works by 19th century French masters, such as Courbet, Delacroix, Eng, Monet, and Renoir. Rosenberg was born into his profession as his father, Alexander, had been a dealer of antiques in Paris before turning his attention to Impressionist and Post-Impressionist painting. Paul initially worked jointly with his brother Leonce to champion modern French artists before branching off on his own, opening the gallery Paul Rosenberg in Paris's 8th arrondissement in 1908. Among the artists he promoted in Paris were Georges Braque, Renal Leger, and Henri Matisse but he is perhaps best known as Picasso's dealer, signing a nearly exclusive contract with this pioneer of Cubism in 1922. Their close personal relationship is illustrated by this portrait of Rosenberg's wife and daughter, painted in the neoclassical style Picasso cultivated after World War I, a style that helped Rosenberg situate modernism within the framework of the French cultural tradition thus enhancing modern art's respectability and desirability. Partly due to strategies like this, it was in the 1920s that Rosenberg truly came into his own as a patron of French modernism. His business and public relations acumen certainly helped him cement and maintain relationships with his artists, as this comment about Georges Braque in the catalog for his 1949 retrospective at MoMA reveals, quote, Brock held his first exhibition at the Paul Rosenberg Gallery in May 1924, and from that date began to enjoy a commercial success. His prices, which with Leonce Rosenberg had been from 800 to 1,000 francs, now advanced considerably, and he was able to live in a manner quite different from that of the Bohemian days in Montmartre." Unquote. Beginning even before World War I, Rosenberg cultivated an international network of collectors and dealers that would later prove critical when he was forced to flee Nazi-occupied France. Rosenberg's international connections have been described in detail in an article by my colleague, Mary-Kate Cleary, uh, but here I'll just summarize them briefly. Rosenberg established business partnerships with dealers in France, Germany, England and the United States, exchanging works with them or entering into arrangements in which several dealers jointly owned and sold individual works of art. His professional network included such world famous firms as the Gallery Bernheim Jeune in Paris, Alfred Flechtheim in Berlin, and Joseph Duveen in London. Rosenberg also aggressively pursued opportunities in the United States particularly through a partnership with Wildenstein and Company in New York, which he established in 1925. Together, Rosenberg and Wildenstein disseminated Picasso's work to the American market. Rosenberg also worked closely with the New York gallery run by French dealer Charles Durand Ruel, whose grandfather Paul had championed the Impressionists. Such partnerships helped Rosenberg reach a wider American clientele including such prominent collectors as Albert C. Barnes in Philadelphia and John Quinn in Chicago. In the 1930s, Rosenberg also mounted a number of his own exhibitions in the premises of the Duran Royal Gallery in New York, including one devoted to Brock, Picasso, and Matisse called Great Masters of French Art in March of 1934. And Rosenberg could also turn to his American contacts to help him acquire stock for his gallery. For example, when John Quinn, the collector, died unexpectedly in 1924 and his collection was auctioned, Rosenberg bought all 52 of the Picasso paintings in the sale through Felix Wildenstein, who bid on his behalf. Now, as the fascist threat increased throughout the 1930s in Europe, Rosenberg had the foresight to send a significant portion of his gallery stock and personal collections out of France, arrangements that were facilitated by this extensive international network. 
As early as 1936, he and his brother-in-law, Jacques Helft, opened a branch of the Rosenberg Gallery in London. Picasso's The Studio, now in the Eskenazi's collection, was among the works he transferred from Paris to the London Gallery. And that same year, it was featured in the groundbreaking International Surrealist Exhibition at the New Burlington Galleries. And if you recall, this is the same gallery that showed the uh, so-called degenerate art in 1938. Um, in 1937 and 38, our Picasso was included in at least two further exhibitions at the Rosenberg and Helft Gallery in London, and also featured in Realism and Surrealism, an exhibition organized by the British art critic Herbert Reed in Gloucester as part of an effort to bring modernist art to British audiences outside London. Another of Rosenberg's strategies for getting works of art out of France was to lend them to exhibitions abroad, especially in the Americas. For example, in the late summer of 1939, he lent 19 paintings by Georges Braque to a major Braque retrospective organized by the Arts Club of Chicago. This group of works included another painting that later entered the collection of Henry Hope and subsequently the Eskenazi Museum of Art, the napkin ring of 1929 pictured here. <clears throat> One of Rosenberg's most cherished possessions, the napkin ring is one of four horizontal still life compositions known collectively as the Rosenberg Quartet. Rosenberg had commissioned the four paintings, three of which I'm showing you here, in the late 1920s, and they served as models for decorative marble panels installed on the floor of his Paris dining room. So the napkin ring, along with the other 18 Brock paintings uh, lent to Chicago, arrived only shortly before the outbreak of World War II and was featured in the Arts Club's exhibition under the alternate title, Marble Table, Glass and Fruit. And um, if you can see in, in this paperwork I'm showing you, which is a, an inventory of the works Brock was lending to Chicago. This is dated 21st of July, 1939, and the shipment actually occurred in August of 1939. So, you know, right, right before the outbreak of, of war, literally. Um, so following this exhibition in Chicago, the show then traveled on to the Phillips Memorial Collection in Washington, DC and the San Francisco Museum of Art. Following this tour, Rosenberg's Brock paintings, which were of course now stranded in the United States, were sent on to the Golden Gate International Exposition in San Francisco, and then stored at the de Young Museum in the same city on Rosenberg's behalf until he could claim them. And we're very fortunate that the, um, the papers of the Arts Club are preserved at the Newberry Library in Chicago and all of these logistical um, transactions are documented there in, in great detail. I'm just showing you one document, but there are actually many, met, a lot of paperwork. This is the uh, just what a provenance researcher wants to find when you're trying to track down the history and the, the movements of a work of art. So now while this uh, exhibition was going on, Paul Rosenberg himself was looking for a way to get him himself and his family out of France, uh, as well as the art. The family had been on holiday in the countryside when Germany declared war on France in September of 1939. Electing not to return to Paris, they instead settled in a small town near Bordeaux. After the Nazi invasion of Paris in May 1940, Rosenberg was able to secure transit visas to Portugal for himself, his wife, and their daughter, while his son Alexander chose to remain in France, joining the Free French Forces. The Rosenberg sailed from Lisbon to New York in September 1940. Now, remember, Rosenberg has had already almost a 20 year relationship with the United States. What I found is that in the 1920s, American collectors such as Barnes and Quinn, who I mentioned already, seem to have transacted business with Rosenberg with some reluctance, for their private correspondence contains starkly anti-Semitic descriptions of him. Yet, while anti-Semitism continued to pervade American culture in the 40s, as I discussed last week, 
the publicity accompanying Rosenberg's arrival in New York seems relatively free of such, or thankfully free of such prejudice. Indeed, Rosenberg's relocation to New York generated great excitement in the art world, with the Art Digest reporting in 1941 that, quote, when rumor first intimated that Paul Rosenberg, internationally known Paris dealer in modern art, would open a gallery in New York, 57th Street, which is where many galleries were located, 57th Street anticipated something akin to a clap of thunder, unquote. The paintings Rosenberg had previously sent to the United Kingdom and the United States would form the basis for the New York branch of his gallery, which opened in November of 1941. The New York Times art critic, Edward Alden Jewell, described the sense of anticipation accompanying the gallery's opening, writing that, quote, a new note of distinction was added to 57th Street over the weekend. After weeks of preparation and a continued uncertainty as to the exact opening date, Paul Rosenberg's gallery has at length unlatched its front door. Most of the paintings now exhibited have never been shown here before. Four artists are represented in the opening display, Picasso, Brock, Leger, and Marie Laurencin. <clears throat> Now, Rosenberg had paid a great deal of attention to the aesthetics of display in his Paris gallery and also took care to offer his clients a comfortable, even luxurious experience, as we can see in this photograph of a Delacroix exhibition held at his Paris gallery before the war. Much of uh, Jewell's article about the opening of Rosenberg's New York gallery was also devoted to the same topic. For Jewell writes, quote, the rooms have been tastefully decorated and the lighting is excellent. The fabric covered walls of the main gallery are painted a rich brown, a color rather surprisingly dominant, though it proves very effective with the present assortment of canvases." Unquote. I'm sorry, I don't have a picture of this to show you, but uh, a few months later in February of 1942, reviewing a Picasso exhibition also at Rosenberg's gallery, Jewell again drew attention to the aesthetically sensitive installation of the 11 paintings on view. He says, quote, in presenting them with such spacious dignity, Mr. Rosenberg has done Picasso a service that in turn becomes a service to the art world, unquote. In New York, Rosenberg mounted many exhibitions focusing on late 19th century French masters, including Monet and Van Gogh, artists he knew to be popular with American audiences. Often these artists also served as the basis for exhibitions mounted to benefit the war effort. For example, in November, 1942, the Rosenberg Gallery staged an exhibition of 28 Cezanne paintings, all loans from private collectors and museums. Um, I don't think this painting was in that exhibition, but I am showing it to you because this uh, went through Rosenberg's gallery around this time. So to give you a sense of what he was showing in general. Uh, but back to the benefit show, the admission fee of 55 cents benefited the war effort in France. And unlike the German emigre artists and dealers we've discussed, Rosenberg could count on American support for his home country and thus emphasized his French nationality. His reputation and network also helped him attract prestigious partners and sponsors for the benefit shows and similar endeavors. The Cezanne benefit show was sponsored by the Comité National Francaise of London, the Fighting French Relief Committee, and the French American Club, among others. Along with General Charles de Gaulle and New York City Mayor Fiorella LaGuardia, the exhibition also counted among its sponsors prominent members of the Roosevelt administration, such as Secretary of State Cordell Hull. Naturally, benefit exhibitions like these further enhanced Rosenberg's stature in the art world, as did his support of American museums through generous loans. For example, even before his own arrival in the United States, he arranged to lend many paintings to the Museum of Modern Art's Picasso Retrospective. And MoMA became one of Rosenberg's most significant American clients. 
as again, as my colleague Mary Kate Cleary notes, quote, of the approximately 800 works of painting and sculpture in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art, nearly 50 hold provenance that bear Rosenberg's name in some capacity, the most significant of which were acquisitions after 1940, unquote. So meaning acquisitions they made from his New York gallery. As the paintings now in the Eskenazi Museum's collection reveal, Rosenberg also achieved success in placing works by French modernists with newer American collectors, such as Henry Hope of Indiana University, who acquired these two Picassos and the treasured Brock from Rosenberg's gallery in 1944. Hope later reminisced about the Brock exhibition, a story that reveals the emotional motivations behind some of Rosenberg's transactions during the war years. For several months, Hope recalled, we had been trying to buy this painting from Paul Rosenberg, but he was reluctant to sell it. That summer, 1944, General de Gaulle came to New York. Paul's son, Alexander Rosenberg, who was in the Free French Forces, arranged for his father to meet de Gaulle. The general assured him that they would be in Paris in a matter of months. Rosenberg was so elated that he let us acquire the Brock. And we see here the inventory card uh, from the Rosenberg Gallery uh, documenting the sale to Henry Hope. Um, it's probable, of course, that Rosenberg's decision to make this sale also took into account Henry Hope's own deep interest in Brock and his scholarship on Brock. In fact, Hope would travel to France in 1947 to interview the artist, and he served as the curator for a major Brock retrospective staged two years later by MoMA and the Cleveland Museum of Art. <clears throat> um, and naturally, Paul Rosenberg would be a generous lender to that 1949 exhibition as well. Rosenberg remained attached to this particular Brock painting throughout his life, even offering to buy it back from Hope in the mid 1950s. An offer Hope declined unless he could exchange it for another Brock canvas of equal quality. And while that negotiation did not come to fruition, Hope did lend the napkin ring to Masterpieces Recalled, an exhibition held in 1957 at the Paul Rosenberg Gallery in New York on the occasion of the dealer's 75th birthday. <clears throat> Now, along with the, among the works in the Hope Collection, which are now at the Eskenazi Museum of Art, are paintings by three American artists who were taken on by Rosenberg for representation by late 1942. Uh, Max Weber, Marston Hartley, and Abraham Ratner, whose painting, Place of Darkness, we looked at earlier. <clears throat> And the gallery uh, also represented the American painter Milton Avery during this time. Compared to Paul Rosenberg's connections with Picasso and other major French modernists, or to his heroic efforts to reclaim Nazi looted art after the war, or even to his promotion of 19th century French painting, his patronage of a small number of American artists has received very little attention. <clears throat> It's hard to say what attracted him to this particular group of artists whose work feels, at least initially, feels quite different from the French art with which he is most closely associated. Nevertheless, perhaps he did see certain affinities between the work of these Americans and French modernism, as I already pointed out in regards to Ratner and Picasso at the beginning of my talk. Indeed, he sometimes presented their work side by side, for example, in an August 1943 exhibition described by the art critic Howard DeVry as a strange melange. Yet, even if the juxtaposition of French and American artists struck DeVry as strange, he went on to concede that, quote, of the 23 artists represented, four are American, Weber, Hartley, Avery, and Ratner, and of all the pictures, all but the Hartley canvas, 
fit into the companionship of the modern French examples without violence, unquote. <clears throat> it's likely that personal connections, at least in the case of Abraham Ratner, influenced Rosenberg's particular interests in American art. As I mentioned already, Ratner had lived in Paris between the wars and had known several of the artists Rosenberg represented there, most notably Picasso. Rosenberg would give Ratner several solo exhibitions at his New York gallery. The first in May 1943 featured Place of Darkness. Ratner and Rosenberg continued to correspond after Rosenberg returned to France following the war leaving the management of the New York Gallery in the hands of his staff and his son, Alexander. <clears throat> Their letters written in a mix of French and English reveal how Rosenberg cultivated personal and not just business relationships with the artists he promoted. For example, several months after the unexpected death of Ratner's wife, Rosenberg sent this handwritten letter from France expressing his hope that Ratner's work would help to lessen his grief. Quote, I am glad that you are working hard. I hope to see very soon your newest works through which you will forget all your sorrows. I believe in you. A lot of people do too. And I am certain that they will find a new Abe, perhaps stronger with an elevated spirit in the new work, unquote. Hartley, Ratner and Weber all cultivated an aesthetic quality that has been described as figurative expressionism. Drawing upon both Cubism and German expressionism, the style was prominent in American art of the 1940s. Many of its adherents, including those represented by Rosenberg, explored spiritual and religious themes in their work, partly from a Christian perspective, as in our painting, Three Friends, which depicts a figure of Jesus flanked by a clown and a boxer, so marginalized, so socially marginalized figures. Uh, and Weber uh, drew upon his Jewish background, as in this work of, um, of scholars studying the, uh, the Talmud. Uh, Ratner, too, would later go on to make Judaism a major theme of his post war work, um, including creating designs for uh, synagogues. But during the years of the Holocaust, he, like Chagall, often turned to Christian iconography to convey the trauma of this time. One can certainly speculate that Rosenberg, who despite his success in America, his professional success in America, was nevertheless a Jewish refugee and one who knew his property in France had been taken over by the Nazis. One can speculate that he was attracted to these paintings for their emotional resonance, as well as their modernist aesthetic qualities. Yet, although critics and curators in the early 1940s considered these figurative expressionists to be in the vanguard of American art, they would soon be marginalized by the rise of abstract expressionism, think Jackson Pollock, which, which suppressed critical interest in figurative art. For example, art historian and curator Randall Griffey notes in regard to Marsden Hartley's late figural paintings a group to which our canvas, Three Friends, belongs, that they, uh, quote, were well received by American critics when they were first shown and contributed directly to the artist's late rise in the ranks of American art. But they fell into a lengthy period of scholarly neglect not long after the painter's death in 1943, unquote. <clears throat> So the eventual marginalization of these artists within the modernist canon is surely why Paul Rosenberg's patronage of them has received so little attention. Yet it's a fascinating aspect of the art dealer's life, not to mention American art history, that certainly deserves more research and recognition. After the war, Rosenberg's son, Alexander, took over the management of the New York branch of the gallery, while Paul returned to France to pursue the restitution of the approximately 400 paintings he had left there and which had been looted. The Nazis had taken over Rosenberg's Paris townhome, establishing in it a branch of the Institute for the Study of the Jewish Question, 
an organization that, quote, studied Jewish culture as part of a program of so-called enemy research. The works Rosenberg had been unable to move out of France were seized by the Einsatzstab Reichsleiter Rosenberg, or ERR, a looting organization founded in 1940 by the Nazi ideologue Alfred Rosenberg, no relation to Paul. Even works that Paul Rosenberg had placed for safekeeping in a bank vault in the south of France under his chauffeur's name did not escape looting. And it's hardly surprising that Rosenberg's paintings were targeted for looting as the ERR focused special attention on the gallery stock and collections held by the prominent Jewish art dealers and collectors in Paris, including the Wildensteins, Bernheim June, Jacques Seligman, and Alphonse Kahn. Many of the artworks looted from Jewish families in Paris were initially sent to the Jeux de Pomme near the Louvre, which served as a storage facility for these objects. And we see in this uh, famous photograph, many works by artists such as Picasso and Leger. Uh, the space hosted visits from Nazi officials, including Reichsmarschall Hermann Goering, who came to select works for their own personal collections. The modernist art seized from Rosenberg did not necessarily align with Nazi cultural priorities for their own collections, and so would often be exchanged for old master paintings and transactions with collaborationist art dealers and auction houses, who profited from the spoliation of Jewish property. A large number of paintings belonging to Rosenberg thus ended up in Switzerland, many with the dealer and auctioneer Theodore Fischer, who had orchestrated a 1939 sale of so-called degenerate art on behalf of the Nazi government. Other Rosenberg paintings had made their way into the collection of the Swiss industrialist Emil Birla, who had acquired many of them from Fischer. Seeking to reclaim his property, Rosenberg filed one of the earliest claims made by a victim. And remarkably, considering that Jewish victims faced innumerable challenges to recovering their property in post-war Europe, he was awarded the restitution of the 28 works held by Fischer and Burla. Rosenberg continued to pursue the restitution of his Nazi looted collection until his death in 1959, recovering about 300 works. His son Alexander and other family members have continued this work, which is still ongoing today. In recent years, the family has successfully claimed works from both private collections and museums, including this Matisse from a Norwegian museum. But other pieces, including apparently this Degas pastel, remain unrestituted, in some cases because works in private hands like the Degas um, are not always subject to the same laws and ethical guidelines that guide decisions concerning museums. As a case study, Paul Rosenberg is both characteristic and anomalous. Like the other emigre art dealers we examined earlier in this series, Rosenberg enjoyed professional success in the United States, being immediately embraced by the art world here. Unlike the German emigre art dealers, however, he did not need to create a new market for the work he sold, for there was already an eager clientele for French 19th century and even modernist art in the United States, partly as a result of Rosenberg's own earlier efforts in conjunction with his international partners. What also distinguishes Rosenberg from many of his fellow exiles was his effort to confront the Nazi collaborationist art market in Europe immediately following the war. While he could have decided to remain permanently in New York, continuing to manage his gallery there, and perhaps even taking on a more prominent role in the increasingly lucrative market for post-war American art, he instead turned his attention almost entirely to the legally difficult and almost certainly emotionally challenging work of tracking down the many art objects looted from him and filing claims for them. By taking these steps so quickly, Rosenberg set an important precedent for other victims of Nazi looting, ultimately sending a strong message that transparency and due diligence in the realm of provenance must be taken seriously and restitution made when necessary. Thank you.
And if you have questions, feel free to place those in the chat. Sure. Jenny, I'm sorry, I was just unmuting myself. Um, through the force again, I mean, uh, for those of us who knew, knew a little bit, we now know a great deal more. For those who didn't know so much, uh, they're now enriched by this knowledge and, and your presentation. Jenny, can I kick off um, by asking from your research and other, other uh, scholarly research, what sort of man was Rosenberg? because you, you made a very interesting comment that his clients uh, at some stage uh, referred to him rather um, disparagingly, uh, considering that they had such a close commercial relationship. What sort of character was he? Does that, does that come out in, in the research? Um, I don't, I don't have a really great insight into what he was like personally, except that um, in looking at some of his correspondence with the artists, that he represented, he actually, he seems like a very warm and sympathetic uh, person who, who maintained personal connections, um, you know, through, for many years. As far as the comments made by some of the American clients, um, I think that they, uh, I'm not sure if both Barnes and Quinn actually met him in person. I, I think at least one of them did from what I read, but they, their perceptions were colored by their anti-Semitism. Um, and I, you know, I wouldn't want to take those um, comments seriously in terms of describing Rosenberg's character because those were comments coming out of a place of bias. But they must have felt that they could, they weren't so anti-Semitic that they wouldn't work with him in order to acquire the artworks that they wanted for their collections. But uh, I, I think you know, Picasso. Uh, just the, the examples of Picasso and Ratner alone show that he he really did create these very close personal connections. And I think he must have been a very, you know, warm person. I, I wonder whether perhaps it's the, the antithesis of this, that the fact that he, he perhaps um, maintained his relationship with these clients on a business-like uh, rather than uh, in allowing them into his personal life. Perhaps that uh, may have uh, irritated his clients in that way. Can I just go back and ask you that the there's much recorded that uh, Rosenberg was perhaps the pioneer of, of the commercial contract with artists uh, in terms of his uh, initial contract with Picasso, where he was guaranteeing to buy a certain amount of art. He was... Uh, funding in advance, if you like, of sales. Um, but by this stage, Rosenberg was already quite a celebrity. I mean, he was uh, extremely, I mean, may well be family money, but he he lived a life of, 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 uh, of, of wealth and, and, and celebrity, I think, uh, which Picasso joined in. Um, is any, any sort of observations on that, given the fact that most artists, uh, we, our perception of most artists is that they are struggling and uh, desperate to sell the next painting to pay the rent? Well, um, I think, I, I don't know, um, I haven't studied in depth, you know, some of these financial transactions, um, but, or, or the question you raised about whether he was the first to establish these sorts of contracts with artists. Um, but it is clear that some of the artists that he was representing, particularly in the 20s, like Brock and Picasso, they, they did kind of rise to the celebrity status, um, which I think we tend to associate more with artists later on in the 20th century and certainly in the contemporary world. Uh, but we yeah. see um, artists like Brock, I think he, he was able, he earned enough money through his sales with the Rosenberg Gallery to you know, buy a very nice home and drive a, a sports car. Uh, so certainly these artists, they didn't necessarily want to be living in poverty or they, as they matured, as their work matured, they too wanted to um, kind of move to a different level of uh, material comfort in their own lives. So, so he helped them to do that by really, uh, really creating a new sense of prestige around their work. Which of course would allow them then to increase the prices proportionately. Of course. Um, I remember reading somewhere that that Rosenberg's own collection was actually huge. I mean, it wasn't just a a, a dealer's stock. It was, uh, you know, many of his clients, as you say, uh, that you referred to earlier on, would come and Hoover up work. But so did Rosenberg Hoover work. I mean, he bought that whole exhibition. Um, 
And I, I, I seem to remember the figure of 2,000 works is, is somewhere in the back of my mind that's come through this evening. Uh, 2,000 works for any collection, any, for any museum is huge, but for a private collection, irrespective of being a dealer, or, or have I got my figures mixed up? Um, I, I haven't come across that figure specifically. Uh, I, I wouldn't doubt it, uh, but I, I don't know enough to be able to answer you very precisely. But the thing is, what I find with Rosenberg and also a number of other dealers in this time period is that the line between the gallery stock and the personal collection could be very blurry. I think we saw that with the Brock painting now in our collection here. I think he clearly considered that to be part of his personal collection. And yet at a certain point, he decided he was willing to turn it into gallery stock and sell it. And um, he did the same with the other paintings that were part of that Rosenberg Quartet of Brock still lives. So there's um, it's kind of slippage between what is, what is a personal work and what is a gallery work and the, um, the contents of the collection in the gallery would be constantly changing over time as, as works came in and out. So I think that number too that you mentioned would fluctuate uh, depending on circumstances. Can you tell us a little bit more about his uh, gallery in Paris pre-war? Um, because it wasn't just uh, French or American artists. I mean, we Brits were there too. Um, Graham Sutherland, Kenneth Armitage. Um, you know, the, 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 the variety and diversity of artists that he actually held in stock and promoted there was quite remarkable. In the Paris gallery, mm. are you saying? Uh, yeah. I don't think he, so I don't think he had any American artists in the Paris gallery. I believe he only took on those artists once he arrived in New York. Right. Um, I actually don't know that much about his promotion of the British artists. You might know more than I do. Um, I'm sure, I can imagine that he, he did promote British artists through the Rosenberg and Helft Gallery in London, but are you saying that they were also... Um, I, 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 I think so. It, it's a long time since I, I, I read a book about the whole period, uh, mm -hmm. but I, I remember thinking that um, the Brits were there too. But, um, but we also, I mean, in Ben Uri, you were talking about uh, the Eskenazi collection. Um, in terms of Max Weber, um, mm -hmm. we, we actually, um, we presented, I just just happened to have the catalogue here, folks. But, um, <laughs> Um, but Max Weber, uh, an American cubist in Paris and London, 1905 to 1915. And um, one of the things that came out there was that um, he's credited with introducing cubism to America. But then, of course, Rosenberg comes in with Picasso and Brack and, and really establishes the, the, the commercial market or the commercial place for these artists. Um, yeah, yeah. So Weber uh, traveled to Paris in the 19 teens and came into contact with Cubism as it was emerging and incorporated that style into his own work. He brings that back to the US. And Weber was very, uh, very successful uh, for a few decades. Uh, his style changed uh, quite dramatically, I think, in starting in the 1930s towards a more expressionistic mode. Um, you know, one thing that, just to go back to your other question, one thing that kind of inhibits our knowledge to some extent of Rosenberg's Paris gallery and the activities there is that I believe the papers for that gallery were uh, looted. And I believe some of them have been recovered, but we don't have as much archival documentation on the Paris branch and the Paris Gallery as we do for the New York Gallery. And the Paul Rosenberg papers are now held at the archives at the Museum of Modern Art. And they're quite extensive. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to visit for a number of years to look at his papers, but, uh, but my recollection is that they are much more sparse um, for the earlier years of his business, because again, they were looted by the Nazis. And, and it's 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 astonishing to try to contextualize the 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 scale of the looting uh, by the Nazis in in France particularly. I mean, um, you know, people talk about a quarter to a third of all the sort of 
reasonable artworks that existed in either homes or galleries were, were literally confiscated, uh, which, I mean, if you try to imagine that sort of uh, statistic, it's very mm -hmm. difficult to get it into some sort of mental context. Um, can I go back to Rosenberg's uh, escape to New York, or at least his planning to New York, and it went through Lisbon. Was Varian Fry involved in that at all? I don't believe so. I believe it was actually the... Um... Portuguese consul to France, perhaps, who, who helped with that, um, who helped them get the visas. I, I don't remember his name off the top of my head, but I think that was, it was at a kind of a more yeah. official level. I, I, again, from maybe it's Von Mendes or something like that. Um, yeah, that sounds about, that sounds you know, great. Um, yeah, because it, it's, it's interesting how, again, through Portugal, there was obviously a, a, an avenue, a road, a road map um, to get out. Um, one last comment, if I may, just going on to, uh, talking about restitution. Um, the it's very interesting that, that when you, you told us that almost immediately after the war, he he took legal action, uh, which was really you know pioneering in that field. Mm -hmm. um, do you think, in retrospect, that actually, if he hadn't, then the whole thing would have even slowed down even further? I mean, and in terms of the Washington principles. Uh, whether he deserves any credit for at least triggering that whole debate and that whole con concept. You know, it's hard to say. It's possible, of course, um, at the same time that Rosenberg was uh, filing these initial claims and around 1947, the, the monuments men and women were still, uh, you know, at work in Germany uncovering looted art and at the very least trying to send those works back to countries from which the work had been taken. Of course, the uh, Monuments Men work was basically cut short by 1950 due to the rise of the Cold War. But I think that the fact that Rosenberg as a private individual was filing claims for works looted from him set a really important precedent, um, again, for, uh, for claims that that others made in the coming decades, and then particularly in the last 25 years since the um, Washington Conference of 1998 uh, took place. Yeah, I, I think that without his pioneering efforts, there just might, I think things, I think it's quite possible that all of this might have moved a little bit more slowly, although it's, it's always hard to say oh. how, how you know, the course of events would have changed. Sure. Yeah, ask if anybody else has got any other questions that they would like to uh, to put in the chat line. I've exhausted them all. Uh, Mr. Koch, I think, is raising his hand. Hello, Mr. Koch. Good evening. Hello. Um, I noticed uh, my sound was off at the beginning, so I didn't pick this up. But um, I noticed that many of the paintings were uh, attached to a university. And I was wondering if those were works that were originally sold under the War Assets Board because of an exhibit that the um, uh, State Department had sent uh, to uh, Cuba and Congress got involved and demanded that the work come back and uh, be sold ironically by the War Assets Board. Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, so let me try to briefly answer. The paintings I showed at the uh, outset of the talk are works in the collection of the Eskenazi Museum of Art at Indiana University, where I'm curator. And those are paintings that were originally purchased by our museum's founding director from directly from Paul Rosenberg and through his New York gallery. The other exhibition that you're referring to, however, is an interesting, something interesting for you all to hear about was a show called Advancing American Art, which was organized by the State Department in 1947, um, there were about 100 pieces in that show, which were all purchased, again, purchased by the State Department from various galleries or directly from artists. It showed a broad cross-section of American art of the time period. And that exhibition was intended to travel, like you said, to Cuba, also to parts of Eastern Europe, places that were coming under the communist sphere of influence. It was an early kind of anti-communist propaganda um, event. And you're also right that the American Congress at the time was um, 
not happy with modern art. And there were several American senators at the time who described modern art in the same terms that the Nazis would describe it as degenerate and such. And there was a political fiasco in the exhibition. Um, it only went to one or two of the intended venues. It was recalled. And because the works belonged to the State Department, you're right, they were then auctioned. And there were three different three other universities in the in the United States that purchased most of those works at the time. So it's a really uh, interesting and kind of tragic example of American censorship of modern art right after World War II. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask uh, Dr. Claire Finn, who is a fellow uh, Picasso scholar? Claire, you have a question. Yes, I do. Uh, we know that in, uh, I think it was June or July 39, that uh, Rosenberg was lending to, it was arranging to lend to MoMA to, for the Picasso 40 years of his art. But how much, you know, in periods of time, how much before that was he... <laughs> do you know? Sorry, uh, so how much before the summer of 1939 was he working with, there was some noise and I missed part of your question. Sorry. Um, uh, uh, how much before June or July um, 39, do you think he may have been moving his stock out of France? How early? Do you think he started to move his stock out of France? Well, I do know that by 1936, he was moving stock out of France over to London. Uh, I'm not, I don't have a specific date as to when he started to move stock into the United States, although it could have been around the same time because he had connections in New York already. I don't have, I haven't come across specific documentation, so that's a guess, but we do have documentation from our, the, work, the works in our own collection that he moved those into uh, the gallery in London in 1936 and 37. I know he had an arrangement with, uh, is it Jacques Helft? Yes, exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, from 36. Yeah, it was really incredible because he seems to have had this amazing foresight as to yes. what would happen. And it seems as if that foresight was also what prompted him to hit the ground running right after the war with the restitution claims. It's quite remarkable. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Any, any other questions before uh, we allow? Uh, uh, Tina, Tina Matania, the, the, um, the heir to uh, a very distinguished artist herself. Uh, Tina. No, Tina, you need to... Need to unmute. I'm there, right. Um, you know, I just wondered, um, he'd obviously got an amazing business acumen and a legal mind as well. Um, how much of the artist's success do you really attribute to him? Because I get the feeling from your talk that he was really a maker of artists in terms of promotion, um, getting the right remuneration for them. David mentioned the advances, um, which seems quite groundbreaking, really. So do you think without him in excuse the pun in the picture, um, maybe their success would have been, you know, not, not anywhere near it was, or what, how do you rate his contribution in, in those terms, those commercial terms? Yeah, again, I think there are probably a lot of different factors at play in these artists' reputations, but he certainly seems to have had a real talent for public relations, um, even the way he displayed the works in the gallery. Um, I think, you know, in the United States, uh, to take an artist that I've actually studied, and I'm not a Picasso scholar or a Brock scholar, but I have done a lot of work on, um, on the artist I mentioned, Abraham Ratner. And what's interesting to me is that Ratner was really unknown. Now, of course, he wasn't living in the United States, but he, he was, um, I think it was really through Rosenberg's promotion of him in, in this country that he did, now he's not well known today, but in the mm -hmm. 40s and into the 50s, his name was quite well known. He had a very strong reputation. And I think that that is almost 100% due to being taken on by the Rosenberg Gallery, which 
it was already prestigious. So that mm. and that connection in and of itself mm. helped people to take notice of him. Yeah. And he started to attract commissions for various public art projects, for example. Right. So purely by the brand, you know. I'm yeah, a kind of brand. branding. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and patrons would be contacting you know the gallery saying, "Well, we'd, mm. we're we're um, putting together such and such exhibition, or we need an artist to do this piece of public art. Can you recommend someone, or can you, you know?" Mm. So there was that kind of, you know, that intermediary role. I think was was so important. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, Jenny. One last final question, if I may, um, and it's sort of. Two questions in one, if I may. First of all, was it purely on the basis that after his father was a, a very successful antiques dealer with no doubt sold paintings as well, or did did uh, Paul or his brother go to uh, art school or university and study history of art? Was there a formal a formal internship or was it a family internship? I'm, anyone can jump in and correct me if I'm wrong. Who knows? But I'm pretty sure it was just the family, the family business, and I'm not entirely sure how his father made the jump from antiques to impressionists um but have having made a foothold in what was for him the contemporary art world that must have played a role in in his sons both becoming dealers in the contemporary art of their generation sure yeah and then Claire, i don't know if you have anything to add to that with your picasso knowledge but claire I just wondered if, if Claire had any thoughts. Uh, Claire, you have to you have to unmute. <laughs> unmute. Okay. Um, I, I was trying to think back. Um, I, like you, I think it was learning on the job. <laughs> yes, with the family. Um, I have no memory of him being sent off to study anywhere. And right, and you could he could have. I'm not saying he did, but one could have done an art history program, but it's not like contemporary art was being taught at this time. This was something that, yeah, you almost had to do on the job and through your connections. And one last question, otherwise we'll, we'll go on all night and that would be very unfair on you as I, I asked you only for, only for one hour of your precious time. Okay. Um, he opened the, the Bond Street Gallery with his brother-in-law in 1935. So we were already two years into the Nazi uh, regime's rule. Do you think this was anticipating um, that actually things could go wrong or was it really just a straightforward commercial uh, transfer of business to, 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 as, as, you know, to try and get more, funny enough to get more Americans buying from him because uh, they came to London rather than to Paris? Or do you think it was perhaps a mixture of both? Again, it's I can't say for sure the way he's, discussed in the literature on him, there's certainly this sense that he had a kind of foresight, right? But we also know that he was trying to cultivate international, you know, an international clientele already from the mid 1920s, at least. And he seems to have had a particular interest in English speaking audiences. Uh, so I think maybe some of both. I think he wanted to create more of a, a market in the English speaking world. And he probably felt, well, and just in case things go, get really out of hand with this fascism, it, you know, it'll be good to have this, this backup gallery. I would imagine it was, you know, a little bit of both. A little bit of both. Mm -hmm. well, a little bit of both is probably the best way to uh, bring this session to a close. Um, scholarship and engaging communication uh, so a, a lot of both uh, we really are in your debt Jenny um, for those of us who have been through this, this this the last three weeks our knowledge of the subject has increased substantially it is a as you know Ben Uri specializes and focuses on the Jewish and immigrant contribution to great British visual culture since 1900 but actually as you and I have discussed privately it's the same. It's the same universality of immigrants coming into a different country and then transferring in, and their their cultural identity into the rich mosaic of their of their new homeland. And uh, and the homelands are so much the richer for it. 
So you've helped us to understand what's happened in New York over this period. We thank you. We welcome you to London any and every day of the week. And we hope to work with you again. And on behalf of everybody, thank you. Thank you to your university for sparing uh, your time and your scholarship. Uh, it's been thoroughly enjoyable. I think there's one gentleman who's put a hand up very late, um, but I'm very happy to introduce uh, Devin Nelson. So Devin- I think it's just applause, but- <laughs> Oh, is it applause? I'm so sorry. Okay, I, um, you'll, you'll appreciate my knowledge of all the different uh, emojis are rather limited. So, um, but thank you very much again. And thank you on behalf of everybody. Uh, my friends, ladies and gentlemen, Benuri.org, uh, we issue a weekly uh, What's On, and um, we hope that you will continue to enjoy it, and we will announce the new, next lecture very shortly. Thank you so much indeed, and thank you, Jenny. Thank you all so much. It's a pleasure.